Yes, yes, yes. And then discussion, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, maybe I'll take uh, two or three minutes more, but I'll try to make it 30 minutes. Sure, sure, no problem. So, so shall I start? Uh, no, I'll, I'll just uh, introduce okay. you. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, so uh, so we'll start now. Yeah. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Chemistry, IIT Delhi. Uh, th and thank you very much for joining this uh, webinar today. Uh, my name is Swamik Siddhanta and I'm the webinar facilitator and an assistant professor at the Department of Chemistry, IIT Delhi. And we are very pleased to bring you this content today, which is the part of the online Pratidwani series that the department is organizing. Under Pratidwani, we invite eminent scientists from different areas of chemistry from all around the world. So these 30-minute uh, talks are held every Thursday afternoon. Please do check out our webinar website. You can find the link to our flyer emails and also uh, on our department website. The webinar series is sponsored by Author Cafe. Uh, Author Cafe is an online platform that aids with writing, collecting, organizing, collaborating, and publishing your research content through features and integrations with products like Mendeley, Zotero, Orchid, Crossref, and so on. Uh, think it like Google Docs, specially designed and developed for academic community, and much more. So today, uh, we are thrilled to have Professor T.P. Radhakrishnan from the School of Chemistry, University of Hyderabad as our distinguished speaker. So before we start, a couple of technical details. Uh, please do not unmute yourself during the talk. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and we will try to get at least some of them through to the speaker after the talk. So uh, uh, before we start the webinar, I would like to um, give a brief introduction uh, of Professor Radhakrishnan. Professor Radhakrishnan did his master's from IIT Madras and MA and PhD from uh, Princeton University, USA. After a uh, postdoctoral stint in the US and IIT Madras, he joined the University of Hyderabad in 1989, uh, where he is the professor since 2001. He has received many awards in his distinguished career. Uh, some of them are Swarna Jayanti Fellowships uh, from the uh, Department of Science and Technology, India, Bronze Medal of the Chemical Research Society of India, Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Ramanna Fellowship of the Department of Science and Technology, Fellowship of the Indian National Science Academy, Fellowship of the AP Academy of Sciences, J.C. Bose National Fellowship in 2011, Silver Medal of the Chemical Research Society of India, Fellowship of the National Academy of Sciences in 2012, uh, Academician of the Asia-Pacific Academy of Materials in 2013. Uh, he has also been an associate editor uh, for the Journal of Chemical Sciences uh, of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bengaluru, uh, in 2015. So his research in interests include uh, design and synthesis of novel molecular materials, including molecular crystals, nanocrystals, nanoparticles, polymer metal nanocomposite thin films, optical, nonlinear optical, and optoelectronic materials, among others. A very warm welcome and over to you, Professor Radhakrishnan. Okay, thank you, Shamik. Uh, let me also thank uh, Professor Ramaswamy and uh, Professor Siddhanta, both of them for uh, inviting me to be part of this very interesting webinar series. Um, I'll just get started straight away into the talk because the time is precious for all of us. Um, I will talk about molecular crystals of a sort of slightly unusual kind, which are defined as hopper crystals. Um, and sort of a curious effect that we observed under electron beam 
sort of actuating process for this. But before I talk about this rather specialized uh, concepts, I will give a very general introduction to molecular materials, the way we have been looking at them, and perhaps even preface it with the philosophy of materials in general. Uh, just want to double check, I'm audible clearly? Yes, so you are okay. audible. Okay, right. okay, okay. okay. So, um, to give a broad introduction to the idea of materials, it is basically the story of civilization. It's borrowing the title from Durance. Millennia ago, it was Neanderthals, they used wood as the tool. Later on, after many, many years, you can see big gap, technology developed and Stone Age came up and uh, soon after that came the Copper Age with the uh, ores and mining and so on. Alloying came up soon after Bronze Age and then comes the Iron Age. This is how the historians and uh, we read in history textbooks about the evolution of human civilization. And then of course we call our current age as the Silicon Age. Uh, incidentally, Silicon is not very far from silicates. Um, then now people talk about the carbon age. So the carbon age also incidentally happens to be close to the wood. Now I put these pictures to just highlight the point that the whole concept of civilization is defined by the materials. So materials define our civilization. So they are intimately related to the way we live, the way humans have evolved and so on. And from a chemistry point of view, <clears throat> materials are generated from some precursors using some variety of methods. Some of them are called ceramic roots, soft chemical methods and so on. But I would like to focus on what are defined as molecular materials. So these are essentially defined by the fact that there is this well-defined intermediate state. And I believe you had uh, some very interesting talks in the earlier, in this series, last week we had supramolecular chemistry. So B. George must have talked about some of the concepts of supramolecular chemistry, which is essentially very similar. So the way we define these two stages of development of molecular materials is in terms of the so-called synthesis, which is essentially making of covalent bonds, or it could be ionic bonds in some cases, or co uh, coordinate covalent bonds and so on and the crucial uh, step of assembling them into materials, which are largely based on non-covalent interactions, which are relatively weaker forces. And the beauty of this is that you have this reversibility. So you can make a material, take it back into the molecular state very easily because the binding forces are very weak, reconstitute them in different ways to sort of fine tune the materials. Sorry? Yeah. Hello, yeah. Is it okay? Yes, uh, please. Yeah, there was some disturbance in me. Yeah. Okay, fine. No problem. Okay, so the molecular materials, uh, this sort of a brief history, again, courtesy Hawkins. Uh, the probably the most well defined molecular materials started with the idea of liquid crystals in the 19th century. But it really took off in the 50s and 60s with the discovery of semiconductors and NLO materials and so on. <clears throat> and many, many more things followed. Organic metals, conducting polymers, superconductors, electroluminescent materials and so on. And again, ferromagnets, ferroelectrics, and nanocrystals and so on. So this is just sort of a, sort of a um, uh, listing of variety of uh, materials properties realized in molecular materials. And one will notice that almost every kind of uh, materials properties known in the traditional solid state, uh, in solid state physics and solid state chemistry and solid material science and so on, have been translated into the domain of molecular materials now over the last 50, 60 years. But of course, there is always challenges to look forward to new domains and directions in molecular materials also. 
So the basic tenet of molecular materials, as I said, is to make the molecule. And there can be very many examples. These are a few examples from our own laboratory where we try to develop second harmonic generation active materials long, long time back. But the more interesting thing which I will be focusing today is on the idea of aggregation and assembly. And that could take the form of crystals and microcrystals and nanocrystals and so on, ultra thin films. So I will run through a few examples of this, um, focusing on this particular molecule, which has been sort of our uh, uh, real obsession, I should say, over the last maybe 20 years or so. So these are very simple molecules. They are called diamino, dicyanokino, dimethanes. I'll briefly refer to them as DADQs. Originally synthesized uh, by a DuPont group in 1960s by simple addition of amines to TCNQ. Now, <clears throat> this is a really versatile molecule, as I will try to illustrate as we go along. And our last part of the main part of the story in the end that I'll come to is also based on the uh, DADQ system. So we did several materials of this for NLO applications and so on in the early days. And in the early 2000s, we found that they are strongly fluorescent in the solid state, which is unusual. That means the solution is sort of non-fluorescent and the crystals are strongly fluorescent. And there's a large enhancement of the fluorescence effect, which is not very common among fluorescent dyes, but now there is an increasing of uh, interest in this area, a large number of families of compounds, the so-called aggregation-induced emission topic, which has been developed by Tang and co-workers and so on, have highlighted this issue that having strong fluorescence in the solid state is, is a, a great thing for many, very, very many applications. So these molecules do belong to that group in some sense. And uh, we later on found that because they are synthetically very flexible, this family will keep growing the red side and the blue one will be the topic of interest on that particular slide. Uh, we can actually tune the structural characteristics of this, this angle theta, for example, and vary their uh, fluorescence enhancement. And these are all <clears throat> of great interest from a fundamental point of view. In this paper, we have looked at why the fluorescence uh, enhancement happens and so on. And of course, one can also look at applications of these materials. Of late, we have been interested in that. This is the first example that we developed where you can actually use these molecules of this kind to image. Uh, as an illustrative case, we took a stomata of leaves. And uh, later on, we graduated to looking at uh, more important systems like bacterial endospores and so on. And this was sort of, uh, we were interested in imaging bacteria, but it turns out that by careful choice of these groups, incidentally, this part, the fluorophore remains the identical in all through my lecture only this part will be varying. By careful tuning of this, we can make them selective for bacterial endospores, as this picture shows. For example, here the bacteria are not stained, but their spores are stained. And we have some insight into why this happens and so on. This is some, again, depending on the type of molecule you use, depending on the type of chains or other groups that you put in, it may actually go deep into the endospore or only on the core of the, the cortex of the endospore and so on. So there is a lot of interesting applications one can look at. Our interest is to continue to look at molecular materials in different forms, focusing on this single entity, this DADQ systems. So we have developed a long time back again, nanocrystals of this, where you can actually tune the fluorescence quantum yield by just varying the size of particles. And a lot of interesting modeling can be done on this effect and so on. We can go to ultra thin films or monolayer films by just hooking up long alkyl chains on them. These are amphiphilic molecules, so you can put them on a Langmuir blot jet trough, make them into nanometric, really thin um, films, monolayer films. And we ran into this interesting phenomenon of an amorphous material going into a crystalline form as a function of the pressure at which you organize these molecules. That is, the monolayer can be compressed to different extent and that can modify the way they are pack and completely shift to the optical properties. And so, on. so these are ultra thin films. And this took us further into the basic problem of amorphous to crystalline transformation by again modifying the groups a little bit. We could illustrate that you can make amorphous particles and fume them in a solvent uh, atmosphere and convert them into microcrystals. 
And this is a sort of one-way transformation from an amorphous form to a crystalline form. And uh, we grew ambitious and tried to do this in a reversible way, which is basically what is known as a phase change material. So essentially you can uh, uh, convert them back and forth from an amorphous form to the crystalline form and back and repeatedly do this. And this is basically accompanied with the fluorescence changes, which are quite dramatic. So I quickly sort of ran through all these examples just to illustrate the point that the molecular aggregation uh, can be done in many different ways. In crystalline form, nanocrystals, ultra-thin films, amorphous particles, you can play back and forth between them and so on. Now, continuing this, we were interested in some series of molecules several years ago. Uh, we were preparing this particular compound and making microcrystals through the standard reprecipitation route, which I will explain what it is, a very simple method. And surprisingly, it gave some very unusual morphology. And uh, I should admit that it was not a designed experiment, but uh, that is what science very often throws up in front of you. Some unusual things happened, and it took us many, many years even to build a tentative model or understanding of it. And that's why I'm able to talk about it today. Uh, so we saw very unusual morphology, and to our surprise, even more interestingly, it showed very interesting response to electron beams when we were taking SEM images of that. And this morphology gives rise to this concept of hopper crystals. And this response is basically a mechanical actuation process. So this will be the highlight of uh, what I will talk about in the remaining, say, 20 minutes or so, uh, maybe, yeah. So basically, the talk will um, hover around this idea of hopper crystals and the actuation. And in particular, I will try to define because this terminology, hopper crystals, was new to us also when we started. So I'm sure many of you might not have heard about it. So uh, I will briefly introduce what they are. And it is quite rare in organics. In fact, there is only one example that we know of in the literature about this. And particularly focus on this particular compound, which I showed you earlier with these two cyclopentyl amine groups and look at their actuation. So these are basically the observations. And we have been sitting with this observation for several, I, I would say even uh, years, and trying to figure out what could be at least an empirical model to understand. So I'll throw some light on it, how this morphology probably evolves and why they uh, show sort of a mechanical response under an electron beam. So that will sort of be the overview of what I will talk about. So going to the idea of hopper crystals. So these are nice pictures from various sources here. Bismuth is one of the classic examples of a hopper crystal. In fact, some of these come in the mineral form, some of them are synthesized and so on. So it's essentially sort of very unusual growth of crystals. And you can see very interesting structures come up. And some of you may be reminded of fractal patterns and so on, but I'll tell you it is slightly different in some sense. And this is a more classic example of a hopper crystal and uh, it's not an uncommon material. Sodium chloride is one of the most well studied in this field for making hopper crystals. So this is the sort of hopper structure. They can also grow in unusual ways and these happen primarily in sort of supersaturation conditions in fast crystallization conditions. There's this particular paper, for example, in Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters, which came, goes through a very detailed examination of how these kinds of sodium chloride crystals grow. Now, this is the meaning of a hopper. It's basically sort of a, a funnel-like uh, structure, which is used to apparently uh, you know, fill corn and so on into containers. So that is how that terminology apparently has come up. Now, from a conceptual point of view, this is sort of a model. Uh, nothing is completely proved in these systems. But the general idea is that the growth rate of a crystal as a function of the driving force, which would, could be temperature, it could be solution um, medium, it could be concentrations and so on, whatever the driving force. If they are very weak forces, the growth rate may be very slow and you get the normal polyhedral crystals. If they are very high growth rate, then high growth rates, then they go into spherulitic or fractal structures. And somewhere in between are these so-called hopper structures. So this is the sort of a model developed uh, several years ago by Sunagawa. And if you look through the literature, there are a lot of minerals and so on which follow this. 
but a very few examples in organic systems. And the only one I could find through, or we could find through searching in the literature is this particular peculiar uh, sort of polyhydroxy, polyphenolic compound, uh, which shows this uh, morphology. Now, so coming to our system, when we started looking at this particular compound called BCPADQ, which is that uh, uh, bis cyclopentyl amine derivative of BADQ, uh, this is basically the simple procedure that we follow. We take a non-solvent or a poor solvent for the compound like toluene and make a solution of this compound in a good solvent, inject it under ultrasonication condition, which creates a lot of seeds and sort of very fast crystal formation happens. And then you can grow it at a ambient temperature or different temperatures and so on. And this is what we saw when we did this growth of this uh, particular compound. And this has a function of time, two minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, the growth time. And if you let it keep growing, you get all these very peculiar stru structures. And this is extremely thin uh, crystals. Finally, they do grow into a sort of normal uh, polyhedral structure. But even here, you can observe a little depression. And if you magnify it a little bit, this is how they look like. And to get a depth feeling, we did a detailed analysis with the atomic force microscopy as a function of same uh, growth times. You can see this crystal slowly becoming bigger and bigger. And this actual plot tells you the sort of a line profile along this vertical axis of these uh, unusual crystals. And you can see that it sort of continuously grows as a function of time. And uh, this is as a function of the uh, length profile and this is the height. So we define some of these terms here just to, uh, to characterize them. So to get a better feel of this, I have a little movie of this uh, 3D view of this crystal. So you can clearly see that there is a large growth in this region. And this is sort of very unusual for a normal uh, crystal growth. So, and we will try to look at this. Uh, we'll just list all the various observations we had to reconcile. Uh, there is, of course, fluorescence, because that is how we actually got started with these materials to begin with. and. Uh, so the, uh, this actually shows the fluorescent spectrum of this. Actually, the, what happens here is as you increase the toluene percentage in the DMS or toluene mixture, there is a sudden jump. And this is what people have been describing as aggregation-induced emission and so on. Essentially, the, there is a sudden formation of aggregates and the, the, the actual there is a small peak shift and large intensity increase and so on. And we could do normal crystallography because if you let it grow properly under normal uh, crystal growth conditions, you can get the molecular structure, crystal structure, and so on. And this is very important. And the most important point here is the, the space group that it belongs to. This is, I'll just note that it is a non centrosymmetric uh, crystal space group, which will be sort of relevant in trying to understand this phenomenon. At least that is what we believe at the moment. And they have nice hydrogen bonded structures and so on and so forth. And it's not restricted to just one single compound. <clears throat> so we did try several other compounds by varying the R group here. For example, if you make cyclohexyl amino, again, you get some very peculiar morphologies. A butyl amino, again, has this sort of depression or sort of a hopper, uh, uh, sort of dip there. But, and these, again, happen to be non-centrosymmetric. And if you go to slightly different uh, some groups, cyclobutyl amino instead of this, they give only normal kind of crystals, propyl amino also. And it so happens that their space groups are all central symmetry. So this was the only little sort of uh, clue that we had to work with. And we still don't know whether this is an exhaustive. It's, of course, still a limited data set, uh, except one, one exception. Almost all the systems which showed copper crystals were belonging to the non central symmetric space group or I should put it the other way. The, among the non-central symmetric, only one of them did not show this upper crystals. All others were showing it. And central symmetric ones invariably showed these kinds of normal crystal growth. So that seems to have some relevance, which we will come back to. Now, when we were trying to figure out this thing, again, my student observed another peculiar observation. Again, continuing with the observations before we go to the trying to understand this uh, process, what is going on this actuation phenomenon. So these crystals were being imaged under SEM, scanning electron microscope. And you can see as a function of time, under a certain voltage, they start bending. And if you hold it at this point, it will stay there for forever. But if you increase the voltage a little bit, 
they can they can be made to bend back and you can do a variety of changes we did try to trying to figure out what is going on we varied a variety of parameters for example the size of the crystal the the beam voltage the working distance of the, the column and uh, the sample how far the sample is from the uh, column end and uh, the coating the gold coating on the sample a variety of substrates variety of things we have done and the opening under electron beam voltage and so on and i will not go into details because of our lack of time but anybody's interested we can then uh, go a little deeper into this but the important point to note here is that at relatively low voltage it bends and at a higher voltage it can be bent back now this is again a small movie of this to show this you can see the voltage changing here actually and then making it uh, go back now we were uh, worried about one issue that means once it bends and comes back it doesn't do it again so there may be some kind of a damage happening in the crystal we tried to analyze it and i'll tell you some observations in this regard a little bit later but one of the things that we wanted to challenge ourselves was can we make it a sort of reversal and one of the clue to that is the straightening at the 6 kV and the scanning speed which is sort of default speed in the electron microscope is about 4 seconds per scan uh, it takes about 30 minutes so my students thought that by making this long exposure that may be creating some it may be undergoing some permanent defects uh, generation inside so can we make it uh, uh, make the straightening quicker that means you should have a little more dwell time for this particles under the electron beam that means the scanning speed has to be reduced that means he tried a long, longer uh, time for the scan which actually gives you more time for bending but then effectively it unbends very quickly and it happens in less than 2 minutes so the bending is still takes about 10 minutes and uh, now so this can this sort of protocol turned out to be successful and as this uh, movie will show you can show actually the straightening will be very fast so you may hardly notice it in this time scale so it bends back and forth so 3 to 4 cycles can be done uh, before uh, you know something goes wrong in the focusing or some burning and so on because these are organic materials fine now so this is just to show some 3 to 4 cycles now there is always the worry that you know some damage might have happened in the crystal so we did a couple of experiments at least to get some input into this that is to see for example the fluorescence is of course one of our very nice uh, convenient signatures so this is a confocal confocal fluorescence image of these crystals you can see the that uh, hopper shape here also and these are different views of the crystal this is the actual optical image of it and this is uh, before uh, bending and after bending uh, he took the picture again and you can still see the all the fluorescence is maintained and after straightening again there is no damage as far as the fluorescence goes and at the molecular level also we have reasons to believe that nothing bad is happening to the crystal this is the raman spectrum which is sort of a signature of the chemical entity of the molecules present and the Uh, the solid state packing and so on so these are crystals actually for this we need larger crystals so we could not do it on the same thing but we did irradiate it under same conditions of electron beam and look at it before and after pretty much uh, seems to be maintained so as long as you maintain the protocol correct we can do this sort of reversible and so now we had a whole lot of material to try to figure out what is going on first of course we have to understand the morphology and then we have to figure out at least a sort of an empirical model of how this bending happens it could be a thermal effect it could be an electrical effect it could be very num- very many peaks so electric effect so we consider many very possibilities so before that let us look at the morphology and what we understand as of now so this is i think a good opportunity because we have a lot of time for discussion i hope people will come up with arguments uh, against my model or for the model whatever so our understanding of this process is the following because this is sort of a new phenomenon so we are still trying to understand the whole process so this is sort of a uh, uh, sort of a picture that you can derive by looking at single crystal phase indexing which is called phase indexing because basically you try to figure out the phase indexing by mounting a crystal in a single crystal diffractometer this is slightly large a uh, hopper crystal and it's sort of fitted to the uh, various miller phases and this is a crystallographic axis and one important point that we understood from here is that this basal plane is essentially the 001 plane that means the c axis is perpendicular to this uh, basal plane and there is a lot of complicated miller phases here and 
to understand what is uh, the how the molecules are actually sitting in this crystal because to understand anything about the bending and so on we should know how the molecules are placed inside the crystal so to understand that we know the crystal structure and we know the phase indexing now we can build a model based on that so to before that one small point is that these are highly dipolar molecules i did not stress it in the beginning but this is one of the characteristic features this is a computed <coughs> dipole moment actually professor sina rao and kulkarni has experimentally determined the dipole moment of some of these compounds many many years ago they are 30 to 40 db in the solid state and this is the molecular dipole moment which is still very high is a computed value and which is good enough for us to build a model so basically this is the unit cell structure and i am representing the four molecules within the unit cell using their dipoles this is how the dipoles are oriented and if you look at the the uh, direction cosines of these dipole vectors with respect to the unit cell axis the three alpha beta gamma angles which they make you can clearly prove that the projection along the a and b axis is zero but there is a net projection along the c axis that means in the c direction there is a net dipole for these crystals now that is as far as we can go in understanding the molecular orientation within the crystals and which could have a bearing on this crystal growth and the rest of it is conjecture so essentially we can make this is the afm profile of this crystal which is sort of a cross section if you like of this along the altitude from the afm image that i showed you so this is a sort of quantitative profile so this actual picture with actual values and so on so you can actually construct these dipole moments you can actually calculate the number of unit cells which will come within this thickness of the crystal which is about 1.5 micron at this end and about 150 nanometers at this end and there is a steep step here which is very important as i will show you later on and you can calculate roughly what will be the charge on these dipoles and what will be the dipole moment the crystal dipole rather than the molecular dipole moment and so on and based on this we have a very sort of empirical qualitative uh, hand waving model if you like of how this crystal might be growing suppose you start with a small crystal and it would have normally grown into a normal parallelopiped or a square however because these corners may tend to accumulate charges and because of the dipole which is facing perpendicular to it it will start accumulating more material and this is typically how the hopper crystals do grow they have high uh, growth rates at corners compared to the faces that is how that sodium chloride crystal if you remember uh, grows large cubes at the corners and goes on propagating like that so here it sort of vertically it is growing and this is sort of a sort of a visualization of how it might actually be growing into a into a hopper structure subject to criticisms and evaluations this is where we stand with respect to the growth of the crystal now now how does it bend so let me see how are we on time okay most quickly i'll try to go through this now understanding this under electron beam response is is complicated there are very few examples in the literature where there is a controlled motion of any material and this is one a well known example now where there is some gold coated epoxy nanopores and they put a laser beam in the middle uh, somewhere here and these be these beams do bend and there is a model based on charging of these uh, insulating materials they have developed there is another uh, rare example in the literature is a janus membrane where they have a different uh, um, ligation of molecules on the top and bottom part of a, a film grown at the air water interface and they also nicely curl up in an electron beam now for our system the way we think about it is the following so this is sort of the picture i showed you earlier now we try to understand what happens under an electron beam and there's a nice program which is in the public domain called casino which looks at a monte carlo simulation of electron beam interaction so we model this system by looking at the the uh, crystal with a different thickness very thin about 30 nanometers thick uh, beam uh, sorry thick crystal under an electron beam of 2 kv or 6 kv these are the two extremes that we are interested in here you can see there is these blue beams are the trajectories of the beams which go through and there is some greenish or blackish lines here if you can notice which are the back, the the secondary electron emissions and if you increase the thickness you can see this actually the 2 kv beam is fully stopped but the 6 kv will still penetrate through and if you have a very thick crystal that is at this end for example 1500 nanometers practically even the 6 kv beam doesn't go through completely so this gives us some idea and this sort of magnified picture of the electron beam track the right. 
Hello? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this sort of tells us one important lesson from this uh, sort of simulation that we did is to understand that at low beam voltages, there is likely to be this green thing that you see here, if you are able to see it in this, uh, this uh, uh, slide, is indicative of sort of a secondary beam emission, secondary electron emission, which basically charges this particles positive. And once you have large amount of electron beam penetrating in, it is likely to dump negative charge within the crystal. So there is a sort of a charging model which we could develop. We ruled out a thermal model because these responses were too quick to understand with the thermal, you know, because these are thermally insulating materials, it is very unlikely that there will be a heat propagation in these crystals. Though we cannot completely rule it out, but we did some control experiments which tried, gives us a feeling that it is not a thermal effect. So it has to be an electrostatic effect. So this is where the <coughs> starting point of our thinking is. One other important effect is when you have a slope. These crystals, as I told you, have a slope at, at some point. Again, using Casino, you can model the secondary uh, electron emission and backscattered electron coefficients uh, with respect to the, this uh, bending angle of this crystal. By the way, we have to put a gold layer to prevent charging. We can do all that in this model from Casino. And you can calculate what it shows is that when this angle becomes larger and larger, the secondary electron emission yield, yield increases. And the whole picture of all these simulations that finally end, that we end up with from the crystal structure, we know there are dipoles on this crystal surface and it can get positively or negatively charged depending on the beam voltage and the, the working distance and so on and so forth. So putting all this together, now the question is, why would a charge sample be, uh, respond in the electron beam? So this is the sort of schematic of the FESEM column, electron beam column, and they have what we call an outer electron and inner electron, which gives a booster voltage, which actually slows down the beam, which comes down uh, this uh, column. Now, this sort of schematic of this uh, electron, inner electrode and outer electrode, which has an electric field, which will be decaying exponentially down to the crystal. And here you have the dipoles, here you have the charges. So one can write down very simple expressions for the force on the dipole, which is dipole moment into the gradient of the electric field. And you can actually show with some very simple uh, algebra that this will go roughly as the length of the crystal. This H is basically the thickness of the crystal and H into E to the power H and the charge force on the charge will be basically proportional to the electric field and the charge which is embedded on the particle. Sort of gives us a very qualitative picture of how along this particular crystal profile, the force may vary along this, because the H is varying, that H is plotted on this red line here. So the black dots and the blue dots tell you the force due to the charge, the residual charge which is embedded there by the electron beam and the dipoles. So these together, now we will put all this together to give my final slide here, which gives you sort of a qualitative model based on some uh, some sort of a semi-empirical understanding of what is going on. So this sort of qualitative picture under the electric field, you have this uh, hopper crystal, which is again the sort of uh, uh, sort of the sort of the uh, uh, dipoles are oriented here, and this is the crystal under the electric field under a low beam voltage it will probably create a lot of positive charge on the surface. As you've seen, at the low beam, it doesn't penetrate through, there's a lot of secondary emission, and it will create a charge, and when there is a slope, it is likely to create more secondary emission, and there will be large charges for, uh, accumulating here. And with this uh, particular direction of the electric field, which will basically be pulling it up here, and because of the small amount of negative charging here, because it's a very thin layer, and the 2 kV beam will probably penetrate a little bit into it, there will be a net torque effectively acting on it, which will cause the bending. And when you go to high beam voltage, it basically all the beam will penetrate inside. It will dump basically electric charge inside the crystal. And overall, there will be a repulsive force from the, uh, the, the beam uh, column. And the overall force will be forcing it down and that will go back into a straightened mode. So this is where we stand as of today. But uh, this is, a, I think, an evolving story. Uh, but uh, the time is also run out. So I will conclude here <clears throat> by basically summarizing what we have looked at. So we have looked at molecular hopper crystals, which I think is a sort of a growing domain. And I noticed in your webinar series earlier, there was a uh, talk by Panche Naumov, uh, who is a sort of champion of the dynamic crystals. And uh, <clears throat> so there is a lot of interest in uh, molecular motions. 
and e-beam induced actuation would be an interesting problem because there are not many examples of this kind where you can control the motion which is very important and uh, this is completely empirical and sort of basic uh, kind of understanding right now and we have some insight into the design in terms of the space groups the type of molecules and so on which are and the conditions of growth of course that is very important no question of uh, over emphasizing that um, and one can probably go into no novel designs and so on. So let me thank the various students who have contributed to the various kinds of initial slides that I mentioned here uh, in terms of the fluorescent materials. And uh, this work, particular work started with Gupta's uh, initial observation of hopper crystals and Senthil who developed it further. And uh, uh, Durga Prasad has been helping us with various instrumentation. He was, uh, Sudhakar was a postdoctoral fellow. And these are the various supporting systems in place which helped us to do our work. And let me thank you. And I'll take any questions or discussions or comments or criticisms. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you, Professor Radhakrishnan, uh, for yeah. the very interesting and insightful talks and uh, giving us a glimpse of the world about sure. uh, molecular hopper crystals. Uh, it was really stimulating and uh, very interesting. So now I uh, request uh, Professor Vishwadip Chakravarti, uh, my colleague from Department of Chemistry, IIT Delhi, to take over this discussion uh, and question, uh, question and answer session. Uh, so over to you, Professor Chakravarti. Yeah, thank you, Samik, for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, take over this uh, session of question and answer. First of all, it's a very, very, very informative uh, talk by Professor Radhakrishnan. And uh, also, I'm very glad to like uh, take this opportunity because I already met one of your postdoc uh, PhD student in Israel who was like uh, in the same department where I was. And I read a couple of your papers before. So it's very nice. Uh, so I'd like to now uh, just go over the questions that I can see from uh, the YouTube, sure. uh, from the audiences. So. The first question is whether the acquisition process of hopper crystals make it useful for specific application? Ah, <laughs> yeah, I think we are very far from applications, but in general, actuators are known to be useful. For example, there's a lot of uh, polymer uh, actuators already trying to get into medical applications to open valves and close valves and so on under some kind of uh, stimulus. But in our case, it is going to be rather difficult uh, because uh, it's, uh, it has to be triggered by an electron beam. And I'm sure you cannot put an electron beam inside a, a body. But uh, for probably some kind of a, a device application, it might find some application some, somewhere along the way. We have not even thought in that direction yet. Right. Yeah. OK, so for the next question is also from a audience from YouTube who is also following our uh, talk. So up to what thickness uh, the bending is observed? Uh, OK, uh, actually, there is one slide which I went through rather fast. Um, maybe I can put it if you want to. Uh, let me just, are you able to see the? Uh, yeah, not yet. I not think yet. It will come uh, OK, I have to share it, right? OK, I will just. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Okay, maybe, I, yeah. Okay, uh, let me share this slide. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's appearing. It's appearing now? Okay. Yeah. I, I will just go to the particular one which I'm interested in uh, because that size is very much uh, an important factor. So, so here you can see is size of the crystals. These are actually the linear dimension, okay? The size in that sense. Because there is sort of a correlation between when you become longer and longer, they also get thicker. So the, the thicker the crystal, sorry, the longer the crystal, the, the bending is more pronounced. Actually, the blue dots here are for a 60 micron crystal and the black one is for a 25 micron crystal. And this y-axis is basically the extent of a bending. So I would say that depending on the thickness, you know, the thickness, of course, is not a constant. It is varying from one end of the crystal to the other. And typically, tens of nanometers, two microns, thick crystals do bend. 
If you go to much higher ones, in fact, when you put a lot of gold coating, they refuse to bend, which we think is because mechanically they are sort of compromised. So you cannot bend them any further. So that's right. much I can say about this. Yeah, I think, yeah. All right, okay. So there is another question from one of my colleague, Ubroto. So he, he asks that if you have seen any difference in the properties for two diastereomers or enantiomers of a chiral organic molecule. Uh, okay, uh, chiral molecules, of course, uh, do give uh, non-centropic symmetric space groups and uh, they do that much correlation one can sort of generalize. So if you have a pure uh, enantiomer uh, crystal, it has to be non central symmetric. And this is one of the ways in which we have also developed NLO materials earlier. And many people have used this technique. Uh, but uh, uh, the question is specifically about diastereomers and uh, racinates. Or, sorry, what was the final part? Uh, okay, I'm repeating again. Yeah. If you have seen any difference in the properties for two diastereomers or enantiomers of a chiral organic molecule? Uh, not really. I mean, in terms of, see, because the chirality depends again uh, whether the, where the chirality sits. Because if you have an axial chirality, uh, it affects even the dipole orientations. But if you have a remote chirality, that means somewhere far away in a remote uh, functional group, it hardly affects the organization in a strong way. So this is a very important problem. We have looked at it in the NLO uh, materials concept, how the chirality can be correlated to the uh, organization of molecules and hence the crystal NLO uh, responses. But in terms of fluorescence, um, I am not very sure whether that has any major relevance, except that you can get circularly polarized luminescence and so on from chiral materials. So if it is chiral right. material, you will get a CPL responses. But if it is a, a, a pure, you know, racinate or an achiral molecule, you will not get any CPL responses. OK, so there is uh, another question from Professor Haridas uh, from our department. So is there any role of surface uh, I mean, like microscopy on the bending of crystals? Surface? I, mean, uh, I didn't follow the question fully. Is there a role of the surface? Uh, surface on bending on the bending of crystals. I mean, uh, I am uh, also not very sure about the uh, microscopy. I think he wants to mean. Uh, uh, let me guess what the question could be. I mean, or does he want to clarify the question? I, yeah, actually, if, if Professor, Haridas, Professor Haridas, if you are here, you can also directly ask yeah, this question. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, tell yeah, me. Hi, so the, uh, you have measured so many SEM measurements, but yeah. you, I hope you put the crystals on some surface. Correct, correct. Yeah, so is the surface... Ah, okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So you are talking about the substrate, basically. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. So substrate, yes, it has a very important effect. In fact, in our paper, which I gave the reference at the very end, just published in chemistry materials, we have given all the details. The surface, uh, the substrate is important because, but in a sort of trivial way, I would say, at least to our understanding, because many, we have done all these experiments on a nylon membrane, uh, which is sort of a nanoporous uh, membrane through which these crystals are filtered. And on them, we do see this observation. But uh, my student has tried a number of other substrates. In very many cases, there is a sort of an HC force between the crystal and the substrate. And that sort of prevents this bending phenomenon. So you will not see it unless it is sort of a non-adhesive surface. And this was restricted to only one or two substrates where we could identify it. In other cases, we could prove it by actually pushing it under an AFM with an AFM tip. You can move these crystals very nicely on these nylon membranes, but not on the other substrates. It is important. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so the next question is from Professor Elias. Uh, so what is the thermal stability of these crystals in general? Yeah, okay. So these materials, interestingly, for organic compounds, they have relatively high melting temperature, and which we have always attributed to these highly dipolar molecular interactions. They generally tend to melt around 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. So up to 200 degrees, they are perfectly stable. and uh, most of them. We have engineered them to make the melting points lower for our um, that uh, phase change materials and so on. So that's a different story. 
But these materials are generally stable up to 200 degrees. And uh, because of that, we could also try to explore this concept of bending under, a, uh, under thermal uh, effects. And with infrared radiation and general furnace heating and so on, we did not see a bending. So we I don't remember the exact temperature up to which my student has taken it, but at least up to 100, 150 degrees, there was no damage to the crystal, but no bending either. So that is the answer as far as the thermal stability was. Okay, so next question is from uh, Saptak. Uh, so he asked about how the computer simulation is done for electron beam in the casino software. Is the real crystal used or the structure is also simulated? Yeah, uh, okay, software is basically simulation. I mean, it's a simulation study. So you model the crystal using some kind of, they have given various geometries. They primarily actually use it for various uh, multi-layer devices and so on. So I've given the reference in that uh, my presentation. It's essentially works on a Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, if you ask me the details of it, I will not be able to explain. But essentially the electron beam collides against the materials and the material is represented using very simple parameters. For example, density, which tells you sort of a molecular packing. It, if you have to give the, uh, the work function of the material, which will tell you whether the secondary electron emission will happen or not, depending on the beam voltage. So you can model a few parameters like this. You can uh, model the geometry of the system, cubes and pyramids and spheres and so on. That is how we could make a slanted surface, which was important for our application. You can put multi-layer structures. We put a gold coat because that is how the experiment is actually run. If you don't put a gold coat, you will see a lot of scattering. Nothing will go inside at all. The gold coat actually is a beautiful illustration of how the FESCM imaging ha happens also. So you can put the material, modeling it with density, uh, uh, the uh, plasmon energy, uh, work function, and so on. These are some of the inputs which will go into it. You can also give some uh, elemental compositions, uh, but not all elements, only some general elements which are present metals and so on. For organics, there are not too many options, but we just give the density. And the beam parameters, voltage, the time, and uh, flux, and so on. These are things which you can vary. So, and the simulation times, of course, you can vary to make sure all the ESDs, the, uh, we do a lot of simulation because essentially to get a good averaging of all those numbers which I put in the plot is through you know, dozens and dozens of simulations so that we bring down the standard deviations in these model parameters, I mean, whatever uh, yield that you calculate and so on. So this is how that, and I should also thank the, I, I should have put it, I forgot to put in my acknowledgements, the authors of this program, I had a lot of correspondence with them. I really apologize for not putting their name in the acknowledgements. Okay. So the next question is from uh, Somik. Uh, so he asks that, do you think we will observe this kind of bending or molecular actuation in case of other kind of radiation like uh, beta or gamma radiation? Uh, very difficult to say. Uh, if our model is right, anything which will cause sort of uh, charge these materials can probably cause it. And of course, you please remember there should be an external field because charging the particle is one thing. But if it has to respond, you should have a field around it, an external field. It so happens in the FESCM, it is all inbuilt there. So if you just provide a radiation source and charge it, uh, I doubt very much whether it will bend, uh, at least not within the way we understand the problem right now. Right. OK, so I can't see any more questions from the audience, but I particularly have one question to ask you. Okay. So. So what about uh, like that, as you discussed about the uh, difference in the, uh, the dipolar moment change during the irradiation of electron beam. So is there any uh, molecular level uh, interpretation like the vibrational uh, change or rotational uh, process is occurring during this the molecular uh, crystal bending? Yeah, yeah, maybe I did not uh, explain it fully. Uh, as far as the dipole moment goes, we don't think there is any change during the beam uh, irradiation. The dipole moment is sort of inherent in the crystal structure because the growth, the growth of the crystal happens in the absence of electron beam. And that dipole moment uh, accumulation perpendicular to the basal plane was sort of critical for our understanding of how the morphology evolves when the hopper crystal forms. Now, our, and there is under the electron beam, uh, 
why it would bend it cannot be purely due to uh, the dipole moment alone because there is a lot of dependence on the electron beam voltage. So that is where we bring in the idea of a charge. So it's a combined effect of charge of the dumped around the crystals because these are insulating materials and right. the dipole moment together. So that's why I gave a, a, a plot which showed the effect of the electric external field on the dipole moment and the uh, charges. And I should mention one more point. It's a normalized plot. In terms of absolute values, the effect on the dipole moment will be extremely weak because the field from the column decays exponentially down to the crystal and it's across millimeters. So it will be very weak field. Uh, but on the charges which are dumped on it, it will be still sort of substantial is what we think. But relatively, there is definitely a change across the crystal. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is very general uh, curiosity. So if you change the sputtering from gold to copper, I mean, is there will be any difference in uh -huh. yes, bending? Yeah, that's a good or question. We have not uh, checked it as far as I know. Uh, we have not tried it. But uh, I don't think there would be a major change, except in terms of mechanical properties of you know the stiffness of gold and the copper are different. Uh, and we have seen even with gold coating uh, in one of the plots, it is there. We have done a very detailed study of it, depending on the time of uh, sputtering time, you get a different thickness. And roughly about, uh, uh, if I remember it correctly, about uh, nine uh, nanometers or something, or maybe three nanometers, maybe, uh, is the optimal coating. Uh, and beyond that, if you coat, it becomes too stiff. So copper might work better or worse, depending on its stiffness. Right. We have not oh, tried. There is no, yeah. There is no role of conductivity of that metal to uh, except object. except to prevent charging. Okay. Because if you don't put a coating, it, it it doesn't really work at all. Because then whole thing becomes charged, and you know no uh, you know it's only on the surface, and it's even imaging becomes a problem. Right. It's, yeah. Because yeah. SEM needs a right. So okay. optimal coating is is a must. Very necessary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, so if I don't see any questions further, so I'd like to ask uh, Professor Somik to close this session. Again, from my side, thank you, Professor Alex. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwadu. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vishwadu, uh, for uh, holding this Q&A session. And uh, uh, so finally, I would like to thank uh, Professor Radhakrishnan for taking some time out and agreeing to come and give this webinar. Uh, to our faculties and students, and uh, uh, we would also like to like uh, host you physically in our institute sometime when all this COVID crisis you know, goes away. Yes, so, certainly. That's, <laughs> our, <laughs> that's our hope. But certainly, uh, certainly, yeah. But thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much for. Uh, I do visit your department often, and <laughs> so okay. I, I think last year I was there for some time, and it was a great thing. A lot of friends out there. Okay. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I will definitely be looking forward to better days when we can travel. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I would also be happy to host. Uh, please let us know if any of you are coming to Hyderabad. You would be thrilled to you know have you here in the department. And, uh, sure, sure. Host. That would be awesome, actually. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Thank so you. Before, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So, before we uh, leave today, so yeah. I would also like to thank all the participants and also the master students and uh, just wanted to let you know that we are <laughs> noting down your attendance also <laughs> and also uh, <laughs> so uh, so the next talk of our series will be uh, held uh, next thursday at, uh, so we will announce the time uh, very shortly uh, it will be delivered by professor hugh uh, ml davis uh, from emory university usa uh, and also like the students who attend at least 10 lectures of our series will be eligible to receive special certificates. Uh, so, uh, and we, and also like, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Anil Elias, uh, the HOD of our department and also Professor Ram Ramaswamy, who is our mentor uh, for their support and guidance uh, in conducting this webinar. And also I would like to thank uh, Professor Vishwarup Chakravarti and uh, Professor Janakiram Vaitla for co-organizing this uh, event uh, along with me. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you all again.
for attending uh, this webinar and uh, we hope to see you all soon and have a great evening bye bye thank you to all all the other people who have joined here thank you thanks uh, somik and vishru and bye tp um, thanks yes, uh, bye uh, bye ram thanks and bye uh. Uh, Okay. Ramanan and uh, Elias, I cannot see all the pictures here, but uh, I'm hoping, I'm wondering who 